This video is brought to you by Tokyo Treat and Sakurako. Hey noble ones, welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking. Today we are checking out the myths about the samurai that you thought were true. Or did you? Well, let me know how many of these you knew were wrong in the comments below. <laughs> The samurai wore light armor that allowed them to be so mobile, particularly when compared to their chunky medieval knights. <sighs> okay, this is a big one, so get ready. Nazuda. I reckon this myth began with the era of video games, role-playing games and anime and manga and it really doesn't help that when you look for the answer on Google, you find all sorts of articles still mentioning this kind of myth. For example, this one. Unlike the clunky armor worn by European knights, the samurai armor was designed for mobility. A samurai armor had to be sturdy yet flexible enough to allow free movement in the battlefield. This was from historyhit.com from the article 10 facts about the samurai. Whoever wrote this not only has never studied samurai armor, but he has never set foot on a, any museum the Met, Metropolitan Museum of New York, Tokyo Museum. And with one article, they are spreading two myths. One, that European medieval armor was, what did they say? Clunky, clunky. Whoever hires these people to write. But also the samurai armor was just designed for mobility and it needed to be light. So what's the reality then? Well, first of all, samurai armor, it's a ginormous topic and there are so many different kinds of samurai armor to just saying everything all together and saying samurai armor equals this adjective is stupid. But maybe it's just me being pedantic. They just meant on average the most famous types of samurai armor, not the little obscure ones, the famous ones. They were light and highly mobile, weren't they? Weren't they? Weren't they? I think one of the most famous types of samurai armor is the oyoroi. If you do a research on the oyoroi, you will find out that generally speaking, an oyoroi would weigh 30 kilograms or 65 pounds. If you also count the weapons, then yes, 30 kilograms, absolutely. But in general, without the weapons, I want to say that the average for the oyoroi would be between 24 to 26 kilograms, so about 60 pounds. In fact, since when we talk about the oyoroi, we're talking about the 11th century, the 12th century. At the time, medieval knights were wearing mail, which means that samurai armor of the 12th century and 11th century was actually heavier than medieval knight armor of the same period. And even if we look at late 15th century and 16th century full plate medieval armor, field harnesses would be about 25 kilograms. Very similar. You know what the difference would be? Medieval full plate armor, generally speaking, tapers at the waist, which means that most of the weight is not on your shoulders, but it's on the center of mass of your body. Oyoro instead was entirely hanging on your shoulders. It was not tapering and the weight was not well distributed. The Oyoroi would be a lot less mobile. I need a drink. Do we have sake? Now, to be fair, they did that because the Oyoroi was for mounted combat. You were supposed to wear it on top of your horse. So you could say that much of that weight, even though it would be on your shoulders, but if you are mounted, it would be on your saddle. But it definitely wasn't an armor designed to be used on foot. And if you did get dismounted and had to fight on foot, you could, but it would be a pain in the neck. Shoulders. Now, of course, there were many other kinds of armor. I could mention the Odomaru, which was a much simpler type of armor, still made of iron, occasionally leather, but generally speaking iron, that wasn't as squared and boxed-like as the Oyoroi, so it would be more around your body. It would weigh eight to 10 kilograms less, and it was meant to be used on foot. And as we progress into the 15th and 16th century, the uh, Tose Gusoku, so the modern type of armor, is developed, which is much more low profile, it tapers at the waist, and it doesn't hang on your shoulder anymore. More. Their weight ranging from 16 all the way up to 25 kilograms. Overall, the statement that the samurai only wore light armor that was designed for high mobility is false and pisses me off. But that one doesn't really matter, does it? Now, if you like the first point, there are many more to come and I will see you in a little bit. Now, today we've got a very exciting sponsor and we've got boxes from Japan. So, what have we got? We have one box from Tokyo Treat and one box from Sakurako. Tokyo Treat is a monthly Japanese snack subscription box 
you will get up to 20 of the latest, most exclusive limited edition and seasonal flavored Japanese snacks that are only available in Japan for a limited time. Sakurako is a monthly Japanese snack subscription box. You will receive 20 traditional and authentic artisan Japanese snack items, including Japanese teas and one special Japanese tableware with your box every month. Okay, so let's try a few snacks first from Tokyo Treat. Yeah. We? And I wanted to start with the Fanta, which I did refrigerate a little bit. It's a Fanta, Fanta Premier Lemon. Pre premium? Pre premier. Oh, Premier Lemon. Premier Lemon. It's got like pulp premier. in it. Yeah. It's nice. Give it a try. It's nice. It's very nice. Kit Kat Cookies and Cream. Literally, Japan has got the best things. Ever. Why don't we have cookies and cream? If you want to have a little okay. bit. Hmm. Oh, these are nice. My favorite Kit Kats. Oh. Lemon flavored crackers. I mean, they're more like chips. They're like puffy. They're puffy, yeah. No, that's great. You drink a little lemon over that. Mm. Are you ready for the other box? Yeah. Let's go for the Sakurako. Is this Dorayaki? No, this is Dorayaki. That's Dorayaki. Oh, I'm trying dora Dorayaki <laughs> first. Tarakimasu. Mm. No, yeah, it has anko. You're gonna love it. I love red beans. It's chocolate bread. Well, we all know I love chocolate. Vegetarian friendly. Yeah, I used to eat chocolate bread in Japan. It's very Oh, very it's filling. just like that? Yeah, it's chocolate bread. I thought it had something in the middle. No, no. It's full of chocolate. Yeah. Look at this little ball! Yeah, it's adorable, actually. Both Tokyo Treats and Sakurako's boxes come with a different theme every month, keeping things exciting and fresh. When it comes to Tokyo Treat, the theme of the month is Summer Matsuri, which is piled high with the most exclusive and flavorful snacks Japan's summer festivals have to offer. When it comes to Sakurako, the theme is Tea Time in Yokohama. This month, Sakurako has partnered with the Kanagawa government and local businesses in creating a one-of-a-kind Yokohama-inspired box design to promote traditional Yokohama confectionaries, snacks, and teas. Also, the boxes have these booklets that explain everything about the snacks you're trying. So, if you want to enjoy pop Japanese snacks, you can choose Tokyo Treat, but if you want traditional Japanese treats, you can enjoy Sakurako instead. Or you could do what my wife and I have decided to do and subscribe to both of these, because we love them. Now, I'm signing up. First and foremost, they are so nostalgic for me as someone who has lived in Japan for four years. These are amazing. But you can help support my channel and try these amazing boxes at the same time by using the code METATRON and get a $5 off your first order on either box. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below. And big thanks to both Tokyo Treat and Sakurako for sponsoring my video. The samurai did not use guns, fire weapons, because it would be dishonorable. They're all about honor, right? Samurai and guns? <laughs> You've got to be joking. It's dishonorable. Yeah, go tell that to Oda Nobunaga. There is a huge misunderstanding when it comes to the concept of honor. I think oftentimes we slap a 21st century idea of honor onto people of the 16th century in Japan. And we sort of expect them to do or not do things based on what we perceive to be honorable and dishonorable. Well, let me tell you, if there is one thing we know 100% is that the samurai did not consider dishonorable having a tactical advantage over your enemy because of superior firepower and superior weapons. From the mentality of a samurai, or should I pronounce it samurai at least once so people don't tell me that I don't know pitch accent, from the mindset of the samurai of that period, it would have been dishonorable not to use the guns because you need to win for your lord. And besides, Oda Nobunaga and the Oda clan in general liked western gunpowder so much that they copied them made their own version down in the Isle of Tanegashima and mass-produced them. Sometimes this mass-production is kind of overstated, I noticed particularly on Facebook, but still, yes, they armed as many samurai as possible, in fact, even Ashigaru, with the new weapon, and they used the guns to take down the famous Takeda cavalry. Now, given from the point of view of the Takeda, maybe it was a shamefuru dispute. I can actually imagine the NANI KORE moment that they had. The samurai most bestest weapon is the katana. The katana. Ah, sa. Most regular viewers of this channel already know this one, so I'll try to keep it short. But yeah, the katana is only a backup weapon. 
that's all it is. Early samurai's main weapon was the bow and arrow. Many people do forget that the samurai is, first and foremost, before being a swordsman, he's an archer, sometimes even mounted archer when it comes to Yabusame. As they start fighting the Mongols, then the samurai transition into being more of a spearman, although they still use bows and arrow, but the spear now becomes, I wanna say, one of their main battlefield weapons. And as we said in the previous point, as they develop guns, the gun was the primary weapon of many samurai. The katana is the successor of the tachi in the sense that it's a weapon that the samurai always carries with him on the battlefield, because of course, if you're fighting with a spear, but you lose the spear, what are you gonna do? Karate chop them to death? So you wanna be able to draw your sword and fight in close quarter. And as we reach the Edo period, the katana does become a symbol of the samurai class, of the bushi. Why? Because the bushi were the only ones allowed to wear a katana and then in that period a daisho, so katana and wakizashi. And the reason why it becomes such a symbol associated with the samurai is because the Edo period is the time of peace. So in a time of peace, what is a samurai doing? He's walking around town. He's not gonna go around with a full-on yari all the time. So the one weapon that he's going to wear is the katana and the wakizashi. And usually as they go inside a building, they would leave the katana and keep the wakizashi. So the idea is it becomes a symbol. You see it, you know that's a samurai. And that's the period also when the whole philosophical aspects are born, the idea of oh, the spirit of the samurai resides in the sword. But that's not something that you should imagine to be associated with the mentality of the Sengoku period or the Heian period. For those periods, the sword is a tool of death. The samurai and the ninja were sworn enemies, particularly if one was a turtle. Okay, the ninja, or should I say shinobi to use a period term, ninja is still a correct term but it's a little more modern than, than shinobi. A ninja is a spy. Now, how much do we actually know about them? Well, we do know quite a lot because they did write quite a bit and we have historical documents talking about the ninja. In my opinion, we don't have everything because again, we're talking about espionage. So it's not like they would literally write down everything. There are many things about the shinobi that we don't know and perhaps we'll never know. But one thing we know is that the ninja and the samurai being sworn enemies, it's an anime trope. It's a movie thing. First and foremost, if you had a ninja and a samurai, belonging to the same clan, they are allies. But more than that, one thing that is important to say is that a samurai is a social class. You belong to a specific social position in the hierarchy of feudal Japan. A ninja is not a social class. It's a job. What this means is that one does not exclude the other. Even though it wasn't always the case, you could, and we know that it happened, have someone whose social position was samurai but his job was shinobi. So you could have a samurai whose job was gunner, a samurai whose job was scout, a samurai whose job was shinobi, intelligence. So not only they weren't necessarily sworn enemies, but sometimes they were one and the same. So check this one out, mutant ninja samurai turtles. Didn't think of that one, did you? The samurai were martial artists and they practiced karate and judo so well that they would kick you and flip you and flip you. Hadouken. I remember this guy literally a couple of years ago asking me, the samurai were masters of karate, right? That's what they practice. I understand, judo, karate are such famous Japanese martial arts and the samurai are Japanese, but there is a huge gap of hundreds of years between the invention of these martial arts and the samurai. The samurai didn't practice judo, the samurai didn't practice karate because these styles didn't exist. So what did they practice? Uh, one thing that is really interesting about the samurai is that they practiced a whole range of styles. Today, modern martial artists tend to specialize. You have someone who practices Kenjutsu, someone who practices Yaido, someone who practices Kyudo, and then someone who practices Jujutsu, with the occasional person usually doubling on a couple of these. A samurai would practice everything because they were professionals and they were supposed to know how to fight in all situations. Armed combat was the focus of a samurai, but they were also trained in an armed combat much closer to jujutsu. So rather than the idea of I'm gonna kick you and punch you, more the idea of I'm gonna put you to the ground, subdue you, and then if I do have a tanto, you know, stick it in your throat. Because I mean, hi, and then behead you. Not joking. The samurai were a small elite, just a few people that had a lot of power. 
Samurai is a big term. A lot of people could be Samurai and then again have lots of different possible jobs. The ruling class was Samurai, even if they were a daimyo, they were also still a Samurai. But one thing for sure is that the numbers were actually quite amazing. Official sources say that by the end of the 19th century, as many as 1,774,000 people were Samurai out of a population of 25 million, which is roughly 7%. And depending on what era we are looking at, sometimes this number can go as high as 10% of the entire population. This is one of the reasons why many Japanese people in our day can trace their ancestry through genealogy to Samurai. Not all Samurai were famous, not all Samurai were rich and not all Samurai were successful. Still, there were quite a lot of them. The Samurai would never retreat. Are you kidding me? I'm not retreating you, are? I think this one is still kind of branching out from the idea of honor, honor, honor. The Samurai were battle-focused, battle-hardened, usually not all Samurai were battle-hardened, particularly in the era of peace, but yes, Samurai were professionals, and we know that they were extremely dedicated. Still, if it did make sense, as it did many times, to retreat during a battle for tactical reasons, they would. You know why? Because they weren't baka. The Samurai would never stab you in the back, it's dishonorable, it's okay, I'm not gonna say that word again. Imagine this one with me. You have got a feudal lord, a daimyo, and you are his samurai, and he tells you there is this man, he's a problem, I want him dead. Find him, he's in the local tavern, kill him. So you, probably with a bunch of other samurai friends, go to this place find this man. But you're a samurai, so you're gonna go to him and say, you need to die, so turn around, because I can't stab you in the back, so he turns around, now pick up your weapon, he does pick up his weapon, and then one on one, of course, because it's not fair otherwise, you would have the duel. But let's say that he was a really good swordsman, and he kicks your ass. And for whatever reason, he doesn't kill you. You lose, go back to your lord, and he says, why didn't you kill him? If your reply is, oh, because I didn't want to stab him in the back and it wouldn't be honorable to have just, I just did an honorable one-to-one, -one, how do you think your lord is gonna take it? Seppuku anyone? They will gang up on him and they will butcher him and cut him into pieces. Honor in feudal Japan, specifically in the times of war, means bringing power, money, wealth and land to your lord. Samurai armor was made of lots of weird materials such as bamboo and wood. Would you believe it? Honestly, mate, what is it with samurai armor? Another wrong piece of information? What are you gonna tell me next? That they used paper for armor? Th no, they didn't. Okay, so the materials that have to do with how samurai armor is made are really, really, really misunderstood. When it comes to bamboo and wood, they are interesting because protective gear that was made of these materials, of these materials, exists. But it wasn't samurai. Let me explain. When it comes to wood, we know that some pre-samurai armor used by warriors of the Japanese, well, before the Iron Age, and even at the beginning of the Iron Age, would be made of wood, and if you want to know more about that, I've got a dedicated video. But there were no samurai at the time, and by the time we reached the era of the samurai, this armor would have been completely discontinued. I mean, can you imagine, a, wearing a breastplate would be like wearing a friggin' door. When it comes to bamboo, the reason why there is that myth, I think, is because early forms of Gekiken, which is like an early form of Kendo, did use protective gear, or bogu, that was made of bamboo, partially. So it is possible that someone saw one of these forms of protection or bogu and thought, oh, that, that samurai armor was made of bamboo. But samurai armor never was made of bamboo. But in the joke at the beginning, I did mention paper, and believe it or not, a very cheap cuirass made of lots of different layers of paper actually did exist, and believe it or not, up to a certain point, it did even work. Although, of course, we're talking about armor that was used by retainers, low-level retainers, maybe some ashigaru, people with no money that couldn't afford iron or leather. But can you imagine that one? Telling someone, oh, you thought that they used wood? Haha, <laughs> that's wrong, but they did use paper. So in a way, does that count as wood? Okay, noble ones, well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember a thumbs up. And if you're not yet members of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Don't forget to take advantage of the amazing offer by Sakurako and Tokyo Treat. You will find a link in the description below. Thank you very much for watching. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Sarabah.